एयोटिक रिगर्जिटेशन इज ऑल्सो नोन एज एयोटिक इनकॉम्पिटेंस और एयोटिक इनसफिशंसी इन विच द एयोटिक वॉल विच इज प्रेजेंट इन बिटवीन द लेफ्ट वेंट्रिकल एंड द एयोटा दैट फेल्स टू क्लोज प्रॉपरली एंड हेंस इन डायस्टोल देर इज बैक फ्लो ऑफ ब्लड फ्रॉम एयोटा इन टू द लेफ्ट वेंट्रिकल सो इन डायस्टोल लेफ्ट वेंट्रिकल इज फिलिंग फ्रॉम लेफ्ट एट्रियम एज वेल and there is back flow of blood from aorta into the left ventricle so main causes of this aortic regurgitation involves either the primary disease of the valve itself or there may be dilation here at the root of the aorta primary aortic valve disease may occur in various causes like uh, rheumatic heart disease then there is congenital bicuspid aortic valve then infective endocarditis okay so that all can lead to primary aortic valve disease and aortic root dilation can occur due to connective tissue disorder okay so those are the various causes of aortic regurgitation quickly let's move on to pathophysiology so the pathophysiology is mainly due to the back flow of blood from aorta into the left ventricle during diastole during systole what happens during systole mitral valve is closed right so there is movement of blood from left ventricle into the aorta now in physiological conditions during diastole this aortic valve closes but that doesn't happen in case of aortic regurgitation or aortic insufficiency and hence there is back flow of blood from aorta into the left ventricle so in diastole in cardiac cycle we read that there are three phases there is isovolumetric relaxation there is a filling phase right and in this filling phase is divided into two that is fast filling phase and the second one due to the atrial contraction so in this isovolumetric relaxation means that both the mitral valve and aortic valve are closed and the left ventricle is relaxing without change in volume that is isovolumetric but this isovolumetric relaxation doesn't happen in case of aortic regurgitation and why is that the case simple because aortic valve is not closing so during that phase also blood is flowing into the left ventricle so blood is increasing in the left ventricle in this phase as well so there is no ivr phase in case of aortic regurgitation now you might have understood that in diastole since blood is coming from two sources from left atrium as well and from aorta as well what will happen to the left ventricular volume there will be increase in left ventricular volume in diastole and the amount of volume which is present in the left ventricle at the end of diastole it is known as left ventricular end diastolic volume right so this end diastolic volume it will be much much more normally left ventricular end diastolic volume comes to around 130 ml so this can reach to 180 ml all right because whatever blood is going into the aorta it is coming back but we'll see that because of this increase in end diastolic volume there is increase in the stroke volume as well fine but before we go into chronic ar we'll just talk about acute aortic regurgitation what happens here you see in acute aortic regurgitation this aortic insufficiency has developed suddenly and there are no compensatory changes which have occurred in the left ventricle so suddenly it has to accommodate lots of blood and if that happens there will be increase in left ventricular end diastolic pressure as well okay and there will be so much increase in left end diastolic pressure and hence because of this left atrial pressure will also increase back pressure is going to increase and anyways left atria has to work to push blood into the left ventricle so blood will flow only from high pressure to low pressure right that is the case in case of diastole but because of increase in left ventricular end diastolic pressure now this low pressure has become much higher right so that's why left atrial pressure also should increase much higher for the flow of blood to occur so anyways left atrial pressure increases and then again the back pressure happens so pulmonary capillary wedge pressure also increases 
right pulmonary capillaries pressure increases there will be increase in hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries and hence there will be more movement of fluid from the pulmonary capillaries towards the interstitial side towards the alveoli this leads to pulmonary edema so acute condition this pulmonary edema develops very fast and it has to be dealt with it has to be treated immediately so that is acute air now let us move on to chronic air what happens that when slowly slowly these changes these damage to aortic valve occurs so in that case compensatory changes will occur in the left ventricle so yes in chronic air there is backflow during diastole there is increase in left ventricular volume and because of this by the frank starling's law there will be increase in stroke volume during systole what does frank starling's law say it says force of contraction is directly proportional to initial length of the muscle so when left ventricular volume increases that means there is increase in the stretch of the muscle right stretch of the muscle so length of the muscle is increasing and as the length of the muscle increases there will be increase in force of contraction and hence leading to increase in the stroke volume so that means the ejection fraction which is there what is ejection fraction how do we calculate it is a stroke volume divided by end diastolic volume that means the proportion of end diastolic volume which is ejected out so we have seen that end diastolic volume increases and now we are saying that because of frank starling's law there is increase in stroke volume as well so that means the ejection fraction the proportion of the end diastolic volume which is ejected out is maintained but you see quantitatively if we see only the end diastolic volume that is also increasing and stroke volume is also increasing now in acute ar we have seen that when left ventricular volume increases left ventricular end diastolic pressure increases now that's not a good thing to happen so in slow chronic ar what happens that because of this increase in left ventricular volume there are compensatory changes happening causing left ventricular dilation and eccentric hypertrophy this eccentric hypertrophy makes the left ventricular more compliant okay more compliant that means it will become more able to accommodate that increased volume of blood without much increase in left ventricular end diastolic pressure it will increase but not that much so because of this increase in the compliance there is no diastolic dysfunction right because it can relax better no diastolic dysfunction and hence left ventricular end diastolic pressure doesn't increase however due to this there may be appearance of systolic dysfunction why you see that according to laplace law which says t is equal to pr divided by thickness of the wall in chronic ar there is left ventricular dilation and eccentric hypertrophy so in this case radius of the chamber increases much more compared to the thickness okay there is increase in radius much more so that means when radius increases you see in there will be increase in the wall tension so for the generation of some pressure the wall tension the stress which is on the wall it will be much more on the contrary we saw in aortic stenosis that there is concentric hypertrophy so in concentric hypertrophy thickness is increasing much more so for the same pressure generation tension is less there the need is that the left ventricular should generate more pressure there is increased afterload so the left ventricle generates more pressure but here the problem is that it should accommodate more blood so there is increase in radius of the chamber much more so for the same pressure tension on the wall increases so whenever tension on the wall increases there is increase in the requirement of oxygen and you see it can lead to systolic dysfunction because when the heart needs to generate more pressure then the tension increases much more so say suppose in case of exercise the heart needs to generate more pressure in that case the tension on the wall increases much more so this eccentric hypertrophy leads to systolic dysfunction so what are we telling here that because of these changes there are certain problems arising here 
one you see that there is backflow during diastole so that means the diastolic blood pressure is decreasing right and here systolic blood pressure is increasing because of increase in the stroke volume so because of increase in systolic blood pressure and decrease in diastolic blood pressure pulse pressure is increasing so you see pulse pressure is sbp minus diastolic blood pressure right and that is going to increase increased pulse pressure will be there in fact it is more than 60 millimeters of mercury normally it is around 40 millimeters of mercury then because of this eccentric hypertrophy and increase in the wall tension over time there will be development of episodes of angina because coronary blood flow will not be enough to fulfill the oxygen demands of the blood and you see that in left ventricle coronary blood flow happens mainly in case of diastole and what we are telling here that in diastole aortic pressure is decreasing and what is the driving force for the coronary blood flow there will be a pressure gradient isn't it and that pressure gradient is aortic pressure minus left ventricular and diastolic pressure that is the pressure gradient so aortic pressure is falling in the diastole and left ventricular and diastolic pressure is increasing we are telling there will be a small increase but mainly there will be too much fall in the aortic pressure what happens to the pressure gradient it is going to decrease decrease delta p so there will be decreased flow during diastole so that will lead to the anginal episodes in aortic regurgitation so that is all the basic pathophysiology of aortic regurgitation very simple to understand now with this pathophysiology in mind let us move on to the signs and symptoms in the disease so how will the patient present first of all that the patient will be asymptomatic with the disease progressing over a period of 10 to 15 years right so when the patient comes with some symptoms the disease has already progressed why he will be asymptomatic because of the compensatory changes which have taken place in the heart so that it will be able to accommodate uh, more blood and there will be not much increase in the left ventricular and diastolic pressure main early complaints which start is uncomfortable awareness of the heartbeat so what is that uncomfortable awareness of the heartbeat that is palpitations okay and that happens especially in case of supine position. So this is the initial complaints which start. Why in supine position? Because in supine position there is increase in the venous return. And increased venous return means that there will be increase in left ventricular filling in the diastole. So already there is backflow of blood plus more blood is coming from the left atria. So now the heart will contract with much more force. Then as the disease progresses, there is increase in heart rate, especially during exertion. So tachycardia during exertion. And slowly over time, as left ventricle fails, we have seen there may be development of systolic dysfunction. So as left ventricle fails, there will be increase in left atrial pressure, development of the back pressure, and hence there will be pulmonary edema. This leads to exertional dyspnea. Breathlessness starts, okay? exertional dyspnea followed by orthopnea so all features of left ventricular failure start orthopnea paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea then anginal chest pain also will start and this chest pain cannot be relieved by sublingual nitroglycerin vasodilation will not help anyways because the driving pressure itself is low and the requirements of the heart have increased then coming to general examination and pulse. There is a huge list of signs when we go for general examination and pulse examination in case of aortic regurgitation. And all these signs are mainly due to one reason only. That is increase in stroke volume during systole and backward flow of the blood during diastole. So what we see in general examination, we see a list of head to toe signs. We will talk about them. But first we will say about pulse. What happens in pulse? We see something known as water hammer pulse. Water hammer pulse. Okay. What is that? Quick rising and fall of the pulse. That is known as water hammer pulse. Also known as Corrigan's pulse. Okay. Corrigan's pulse. 
and sometimes in case of severe aortic regurgitation or when aortic regurgitation is present in combination with aortic stenosis we can also get pulses bisferians so this is pulse with two peaks for details of all the different types of pulse i have made another video please have a look on that as well so anyways here we can get two peaks so it is pulses bisferians then coming to general examination signs what we can see is there can be presence of head nodding head nodding with each systole there is bobbing motion of head so imagine how much force with which the blood is coming right it is causing the bobbing motion of the head similarly we can see the carotids they are known as dancing carotids that is easily visible distension and collapse of these carotids occurs this is known as dancing carotids or also known as corrigan's neck sign so we have seen corrigan's pulse now this is corrigan's neck sign that is dancing carotids then there is a whole list of signs which we see from head to toe first there is lighthouse sign that is seen in forehead alternate flushing and blanching on the forehead so head here forehead lighthouse sign right then there is landolfi sign where there is alternate constriction and dilation of the pupil so with each systole and diastole this is happening right so alternate constriction and dilation of pupil is landolfi sign muller sign mu is u so that is pulsations in the uvula so that is muller sign again with systole and diastole then quinque sign quick remember quick we say with our fingers quick right so this is alternate flushing and blanching of the nail beds quinque sign rosenbeck sign is pulsations in the liver gerhard sign is pulsation in the spleen so we have to palpate liver and spleen for this and we will feel the pulsations in the liver as well as in the spleen trobe sign is when we auscultate the femoral artery so we are going from head to toe right so when we auscultate the femoral artery we hear a booming pistol shot like sound so that is trobe sign how to remember trobe so i do t i make a f femoral artery b for booming pistol shot sound then there is jurosi sign so for this uh, trobes as well as jurosi sign we have to auscultate femoral artery in jurosi sign we have to auscultate with the bell of the stethoscope and uh, when we compress a little bit the femoral artery we hear a to and fro murmur in the femoral artery so that is jurosi sign and then there is hill sign for this we have to record lower limb blood pressure as well and what we get is that popliteal blood pressure is 20 mm higher than that case of brachial artery blood pressure why is it that again it is because of the runoff popliteal blood pressure is higher because uh, increased hydrostatic pressure is present in the lower limbs so normally also blood pressure in lower limbs is higher however in this case because of the runoff it is much much higher so there is a difference of 20 mm mercury between popliteal blood pressure and brachial artery blood pressure so those are the various signs in case of aortic regurgitation coming to the examination of the cardiovascular system what we will see so in inspection and palpation we see apex beat which is shifted outward and downward that is because of the eccentric hypertrophy outward and downward shifted apex beat then we can also feel the thrill that is diastolic thrill can be felt because of the back flow right so diastolic thrill along left sternal border their aorta is there so back flow is happening there only along the aortic valve so along the left sternal border we will feel the diastolic thrill then we may also feel the systolic thrill why because we are telling that there is increased blood flow during systole so systolic thrill also can be palpable and blood is moving from the left ventricle into the aorta so this systolic thrill is palpable in the suprasternal notch and it can be transmitted along the carotid arteries as well so we palpate carotid arteries we can feel that thrill then what are the features which we see in auscultation 
there can be three types of murmurs one is the diastolic murmur definitely because there is a backflow so there is diastolic murmur and this diastolic murmur is of decrescendo pattern decrescendo quality why see diastolic murmur occurs during diastole and the murmur depends on the aortic pressure minus the left ventricular pressure so as the blood flows from aorta to the left ventricle what is happening that aortic pressure is decreasing and left ventricular pressure is increasing so the gradient for the blood flow is decreasing so once the gradient is decreasing the quality of the murmur the intensity of the murmur is changing with the period of the diastole so that is decrescendo diastolic murmur so if we draw the phases of the cardiac cycle like this between s1 and s2 is systole and between s2 and s1 is diastole okay this decrescendo murmur we can draw like this that its intensity is decreasing okay then there can be another diastolic murmur as well known as austin flint murmur and austin flint murmur is because this backward flow of blood is touching the mitral valve so during the diastole there is some displacement of this mitral valve basically the anterior leaflet of mitral valve gets displayed and that produces a sound so how to differentiate that which murmur is this decrescendo murmur or austin flint murmur because both are happening in the diastole we have to auscultate on certain areas this diastolic decrescendo murmur it is happening because of the blood flow across the aortic wall so this is best heard in aortic area okay on the other hand you see this austin flint murmur this is due to the displacement of the mitral valve by this blood flow stream itself but mitral valve is involved so this is best heard apex of the heart that is fifth intercostal space left side and the mid clavicular line okay so that is austin flint murmur then this decrescendo murmur is best heard with patient sitting up and leaning forward with breath held in forced expiration why with the breath held in forced expiration venous return to left side of the heart increases remember in expiration venous return to the right side of the heart decreases but in expiration the pulmonary vessels collapse and because of that venous return to the left side of the heart increases right left side of heart increases so that means there will be more filling on the left ventricle and hence in systole there will be more ejection and consecutively in diastole there will be more backward flow secondly any maneuver which increases a peripheral vascular resistance then there is increased resistance to the blood flow in aorta right so any maneuver that increases the peripheral vascular resistance that will also increase this backward flow and increase the intensity of this murmur so examples of these maneuvers are hand grip exercises so we ask the person to perform hand grip exercises and we then auscultate auscultatory features will increase then there is a third type of murmur also we can hear so first is diastolic decrescendo murmur there is austin flint murmur third murmur which can be heard is in systolic phase and that is systolic ejection murmur because systolic flow is increasing there is increase in the stroke volume so that can also lead to systolic ejection murmur again this systolic murmur is best heard in the aortic area because flow is increasing through the aortic wall so that was all about pathophysiology of aortic regurgitation and we saw how based on those pathophysiology various signs and symptoms are seen thanks for watching the video if you liked it do press the like button share the video with others and don't forget to subscribe to the channel physiology open thank you